The start of 2016 has witnessed a sharp escalation in the militarization of the South China Sea. The cause of the escalation is multifaceted and comes from both regional and international quarters. The militarization has been initiated and exacerbated by both China and the United States, both bearing responsibility for the current level of tension in the region. The USS John C. Stennis Carrier Strike Group sailed to the region from its home port in Bremerton, Washington on January 15 and passed through the Luzon Strait separating Taiwan and the Philippines on March 1. The Stennis is accompanied by the guided missile cruisers, the USS Antietam and the USS Mobile Bay, as well as the guided missile destroyers USS Stockdale and USS Chung Hoon. The Antietam is based at Yokosuka, Japan and was ordered off its normal patrol to join the carrier strike group. The 7th Fleet flagship, the USS Blue Ridge, is also in the area having docked in Manila on March the 4th. Trilateral talks were held on board the Blue Ridge on March the 5th between the US Navy, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces and the Philippine Navy. The key subject of discussion was how the three nations can work together to confront China in the South China Sea, promote security and stability in the region, and develop future multilateral training and exercises. The current deployment of the Stennis CSG to the region follows the previous deployment of the USS Lamson guided missile destroyer to the Spratly Islands last October, and the USS Curtis Wilbur to the Paracel Islands in late January of this year. The US has also increased surveillance flights over the areas by P-8 Poseidon patrol aircraft, as well as in one case B-52 strategic bombers. The navies of China and Vietnam fought a naval engagement for control of the Paracel Islands in 1974, which resulted in China's de facto control of the islands. China has established a military presence on Woody Island since that time, and has engaged in an extensive expansion of the base in recent years. Woody Island now has an extensive military airbase with a number of newly built hangars and munition storage buildings. In February, satellite surveillance revealed the deployment of two batteries of HQ-9 surface-to-air missile launchers, as well as supporting vehicles such as an engagement radar and the Type 305B ASAR acquisition radar on the northern end of the island. Last November, China announced the deployment of J-11 fighters to Woody Island. As land reclamation and building efforts on the part of the Chinese continue at Fiery Cross Reef and Mischief Reef in the Spratly Islands, with no signs of slowing down in the immediate future, it will be interesting to see if the US Navy increases the size and tempo of future patrols in the area. With the Royal Australian Navy taking delivery of its second Canberra-class LHD, HMAS Adelaide, on December 4th of last year, and the first of two Makassar-class LPD vessels built by Indonesia for the Philippine Navy, the BRP Tarlac, launched on January 17th of this year, the US Navy may soon be bolstered by more powerful regional navies in future patrols. The Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, announced in November of last year his willingness to have the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces join the US Navy in patrols of the South China Sea. Australian P-3 Orion Maritime Patrol aircraft are currently flying Freedom of Navigation missions in the region. It was reported just days ago on March the 9th that the United States and Australia were negotiating the basing of more US strategic bombers, including the supersonic B-1 and aerial tankers at Australian bases on a rotational basis. The aircraft would be based at Tyndall and Darwin in Northern Australia. They would complement US B-52 strategic bombers already based at Darwin on a similar rotation. As the brinkmanship continues, with no signs of either China or the United States backing down, the chances of a military confrontation in the South China Sea, whether calculated or accidental, continue to grow with each passing day.
US Naval Services have released a new maritime strategy, a plan that describes how the Navy, Marine Corps and Coast Guard will design, organize and employ naval forces in support of its global dominance. The new strategy, titled A Cooperative Strategy for the 21st Century Superpower, highlighted forward, engaged and ready as key words and kept the original theme of ensuring our capability to intervene overseas. It calls for increasing the Navy's forward presence to 120 ships by 2020, up from about 97 ships today. This includes forward basing four ballistic missile defense destroyers in Spain and stationing another attack submarine in Guam by the end of 2015. The Navy is scheduled to increase presence in the Middle East from 30 ships today to 40 by 2020. The strategy reinforces the continued need to strengthen the partnerships and alliances by stressing the importance of operating in NATO maritime groups and participating in international training exercises. The US strategy emphasizes operating forward and making proxies across the globe, especially in the Indo-Asian Pacific region. Thus, the hard anti-Russian rhetoric of Washington is a sign of the global standoff. At the very same time, the United States is preparing to go deeper and deal with China. The US strategists are concerned about rise of Chinese naval forces and its expansion to the Pacific Ocean. Particularly, they aim to prevent a situation where China will be able to defend particular zones of sea communications from foreign intervention. This is Chinese DF-21D anti-ship ballistic missiles purpose. In 2008, the US Department of Defense estimated that China had 60 to 80 missiles and 60 launchers. The risk of establishing area denied operational environment, for instance, in the South China Sea, worries architects of the strategy. Since the American pivot towards Asia, a tolerant term for the US deterrence policy against China, in 2011, the United States Navy has deployed 60% of all of its powers in Asian Pacific region. Indeed, it's ready to deploy even more in order to establish its own control in China's zone of interest. Armed with its own unparalleled navy, the US gets a louder voice and more power to restrict military or economy use of the oceans by other countries. In other words, it indicates the US intention to control the trade in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, or even monopolize it in those waters. Now here's where the problem is. In April, China overtook the United States as the world's top importer of crude oil, and 80% of this oil, and many other important resources, China imports through the Malacca Strait, which the Chinese Navy doesn't control. In this context, it's clear why Beijing claims sovereignty over nearly all of the South China Sea, and is building a military base in Djibouti. China supports counter-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden, conducts humanitarian assistance and disaster response missions enabled by its hospital ship, and participates participates in large-scale, multinational naval exercises. Washington immediately protested against the China-Djibouti relations and expressed concern over China's plans to build a military base in the Obok region, but to no avail. China has to defend the supply of oil over a long way and isn't able to do it right now. Problem is, it doesn't have enough naval bases along vital shipping lines as of yet. Strings of Pearl's strategy, initially suggested as a series of seaports and naval bases stretching along the Indian Ocean, has to resolve this issue. The seaports will be support places and investments that could pay dividends on a strategic level while causing broader security amenities. China's naval defense strategy is grounded on the combination of offshore waters defense with open seas protection concepts. The offshore waters defense consists of two missions. One is to protect China's eastern coastal area, which has the country's most economically vibrant region. The other is to ensure the safety of the expanding shipping lines that are vital to China's economic growth. Open seas protection concept also has two elements. One is to extend maritime protection to waters over 600 miles from the Chinese coast by building supply depots in the disputed South China Sea, trying to conduct submarine activities in the Indian Ocean and acquiring bases beyond the region. The other is to develop capabilities to conduct non-conventional security operations outside the region, such as naval diplomacy, joint maritime law enforcement and humanitarian assistance. Compared with the United States, the PLA Navy has sufficient self-defense capabilities, but deficiency in cross-region operations and force projection is evident, though Beijing is trying to change that. On the other side, China's unique geographical location allows it to establish control over its local seas, the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea and the 
South China Sea. That is what the United States has accused China of doing in the last five to ten years. The so-called anti-access area denial A2 AD or the Fort Fleece strategy. This is the real reason for the boiling over for China's island work in the South China Sea. Washington is sufficiently alarmed by a perspective to lose the maritime control in the region and has started the naval force race under an umbrella term of all domain access. Despite this, Beijing is adamant. In June, China said it was shifting work on disputed South China Sea islands from the dredging of land to the construction of military and other facilities. The US containment policy against China includes not only holding of old alliances, but a creating of new. In the recent strategy, Washington pledges to strengthen cooperation with six long-standing allies, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, the Philippines, the Republic of Korea, and Thailand, and also lists eight new partners, Bangladesh, Brunei, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Micronesia, Pakistan, Singapore, Vietnam. With help of its Asian allies, the US are going to seal off the PLA Navy in South China Sea and prevent its moving into operational space. Further, Washington's diplomatic rhetoric over the long-standing allies, shared strategic interests and cooperation in Asia, in fact, is aimed at establishing a coalition against China. Despite the fact that the US official strategy is ignoring the Taiwan issue, the island may easily become a flashpoint of ongoing confrontation, and the Western media machine has already set the ground for it. On July 22nd, US magazine, The Diplomat, reported that the People's Liberation Army soldiers were seen running towards a building that bears a striking resemblance to the Japanese-built presidential office in Taipei. During the Series C of this year's Live Fire Stride 2015 Zurine military exercises, the magazine argues two things. First is that PLA is practicing the storming of the presidential office to bring pressure on Taiwan in the context of its presidential and legislative elections in January 16, 2016. Second is Chinese military has been preparing to invade the island, but the fact should be taken in its proper context. The military drills are a signal not for Taiwan, but for the US. China shows its capacity to solve a Taiwan problem by force to predict an attempt to use the island for strengthening of the US military presence. Also, aggressive action activity of US special services through Taiwan or an economic sabotage threatening it. In other cases, Beijing would much prefer to reintegrate Taiwan without having to resort to force, but by cultural, economic and political tools. Moreover, it already has a successful experience of lost territories reintegration, Macau and Hong Kong. Another area of the US-China geopolitical confrontation is the Indian Ocean. US strategists, media outlets and public experts argue India is a rival state for China. Monetary wealth and power growth of both states will result in inevitable clashes between them. According to them, the motive behind the String of Pearls strategy isn't in solving the logistical problems of China's maritime Silk Route, but are in encircling India. If established commercial ports will be militarized with the PLA Navy, the concerns about China's influence in the Indian Ocean region empower the US to involve India in the American area of influence as part of a global anti-China strategy. The good news for Washington is India has been actively building a new powerful fleet, including an aircraft carrier group, so it could be a very useful tool. Directly, Chinese and Indian maritime interests face off in Sri Lanka, leaving the Indians' area of influence under the impact of China's economic projects. For Beijing, ports of Sri Lanka, founded by Chinese investments, are a cell in planned maritime infrastructure from South China to Pakistan, a natural opponent of India involved in China's maritime silk route. The US will likely use these features to set on fire China-India relations, to use Indian political, military and economic power to discourage Beijing from adopting its maritime policy in the Indian Ocean. The US's strategic purpose is to seal off the PLA Navy in the South China Sea and prevent its moving in operational space and encircle China by land. In this order, the US holds old and new alliances with nations in the Indo-Asia-Pacific region. The US media machine has already started information aggression against China-Taiwan relations in order to support the rise of Washington's influence on the island. Meanwhile, American special services will try to fuel Pakistan and Sri Lanka in order to make a triangle where the US and India oppose China in the Indian Ocean region. With Washington's support, the tension will also also raise in the South China Sea, where Malaysia, Taiwan, Vietnam, Brunei and the Philippines claim maritime territory. The US naval services will constantly strengthen their presence there in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, while preparing to deal a crushing blow to Beijing. 
China will answer with its fortress fleet strategy in its local seas by building a powerful Pacific fleet and putting into practice the Maritime Silk Route project infrastructure in the Indian Ocean, all the while developing the relations with the Russian Federation in Eurasia. Also, India and China can absorb a lot of profit from the mutually advantageous cooperation. The only thing that they need for it is a mediator to start a constructive dialogue. Russia, which has a good fellowship with both, may become that mediator. This will solve the tensions in the region and allow the nations to go on to further development. After months of mounting rhetorical war, the United States has conducted a patrol through the South China Sea. On Tuesday, the guided missile destroyer USS Lassen transited the area, sailing within 12 nautical miles of at least two China-made islands. A Chinese guided missile destroyer and a naval patrol ship shadowed and gave warnings to the US warship. Then Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Yang Zesu summoned US Ambassador Max Baucus, lodging serious representations and expressing strong discontent over a US warship patrol. Beijing's attitude was that the US threatened China's sovereignty and security interests. In turn, Washington has demonstrated with this action that it rejects China's claim that the built islands mark Chinese territorial waters. Indeed, it wasn't the first public confrontation of the US and China. Tuesday's U.S. patrol parallels the response to China's 2013 assertion of its expanded air defense identification zone in the East China Sea. Washington responded by dispatching two B-52 bombers to fly through the newly claimed Chinese airspace, defying China's rights to assert sovereignty over what the United States classified as international airspace. The official U.S. position is that its vessels would sail close to land masses occupied by Vietnam and the Philippines, as well as to demonstrate support for freedom of navigation, rather than the specific targeting of China. Nonetheless, it's clear that these so-called freedom of navigation patrols will continue. The U.S. regional allies also claiming the South China Sea waters will likely welcome the actions. Despite the rhetoric about a freedom of navigation, the U.S. has pragmatic interests in this region. In the ongoing U.S.-China standoff in the Indo-Asia-Pacific region, the East and South China Seas, the Strait of Malacca, the Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean, as well as countless peripheral lagoons and bays, a crucial point of the competition. Ownership of a particular island, reef or rock, and the right to name a body of water is more than a question of sentimentality. It is the foundation of many national policy strategies. Securing the right to patrol, build bases, and regulate trade through these waterways can mean access to resources critical to sustain economic growth and political stability. The Obama's pivot to Asia and the U.S. newly released maritime strategy de facto means that Washington has taken a course on a long-standing countering of China's influence in the region. A core but often unstated component of the U.S. national strategy is to maintain global superiority at sea. By controlling the seas, the United States is able to deploy military power and to control the movement of goods worldwide. China's maritime strategy aimed to defend its eastern coastal area and crucial maritime routes in the Indian Ocean challenges the American approach. China has already stated continued incursions will lead to more concrete responses. The question now is one of the next steps. It's likely that neither side with contrary maritime interests will find the answer to avoid a crisis even if they did want to do this. Furthermore, they have domestic and international reasons not to step back from their contradictory positions. In the Indo-Asia Pacific region, the US has been rapidly building political, economic and military alliances to balance the rays of China's economic and military power. Beijing can't ignore this fact. Thus, both sides systematically move to a situation making possible a confrontation, but firstly, the tensions should escalate into crisis in the South China Sea.